they don't have the G in their language. He was a prominent Jewish grammarian from the city of Gaza. Uh, in around the year 1020, you have uh, a dispute of inheritance among the Jews in Rafa, right? And may Allah keep Rafa safe uh, from the impending uh, seems oppression that is about to unfold there. May Allah protect it. Uh, it was so this dispute was brought to a Muslim court because the Jews couldn't settle it among themselves. So they went to the local qadi and they tried to get him to settle it. The next one is probably the most interesting one. So later on at the bottom you see that the two Jewish communities that were very closely connected were Fustat and Gaza, right? And Fustat would later become which city in the Middle East? Ummah Dunya. Cairo, right? Cairo. Um, so Fustat would later develop, like beside it, would develop into the city of Cairo. Um, and, and you see in the last point there, but I want to focus on the middle point. In the year 1052, a group of Jews from Jerusalem and Gaza visited fields near Gaza, including the property of the Qadi of Gaza, whose name was Salama bin Mahmud, to test the Aviv. Have you guys heard this word before, Aviv? Right? What's the capital of Israel? Tel Aviv. Right, Tel means hill, and Aviv refers to the ripeness of the growing grain. And this is a specific thing in the, the Jewish religion, that this is one of the ways by which they mark their calendar. So this was a calendar dispute. By the way, the other way that they mark their calendar, the other Jews, is by moon sighting. Right? So you can think of this as the moon sighting versus calculation debate in the Jewish tradition that is unfolding in the city of Gaza a thousand years ago under Muslim rule and in consultation with the local Qadi of the Muslim Salama bin Mahmud. And they wanted to determine whether that year could be a leap year. Um, and Gaza was considered by the Jews of the time in their writing, it says the extremity of Palestine. So it's one of the extremities, one of the corners of Palestine. And so checking the Aviv there was important so they could establish some consistency in their calculations throughout the region of Palestine. So they're active, they are there, they're able to practice their religion, sometimes with the cooperation of the local Muslim authorities. Um, and, uh, you know, they are, uh, it, some of them are excelling in particular careers, such as the perfume trade uh, or as a grammarian, as we see in the examples here. And then we move to the period of the Crusades. Now, Gaza itself is not attacked during the First Crusade, but it does become part of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, at the end of the First Crusade in 1099. So that's when the Jerusalem is conquered by the Crusaders. The Umari Mosque, which is a mosque that had been established beforehand, um, named after, who is it named after? Who was the Khalifa at the time of the conquest of Palestine? Umar radiallahu anhu, right? It's named the Umari Masjid after him. So they turned it into a church, the Crusaders for the period for which they controlled Gaza. They turned it into a Latin cathedral, ironically dedicated to Yahya alayhi salam, St. John the Baptist. Um, and they also built a fort close by, uh, you know, reinvigorated a fort close by to the city of Gaza. And then in 1149, Gaza became a base for the Knights Templar, which is one of these chivalrous orders of the Knights that were given, you know, this is the origins of secret service type stuff, right? Like you have special missions that a group of Knights are sent on to achieve, and they're not just ordinary soldiers. So the Knights Templar were based after 1149 in the city of Gaza. It continued to be a center of trade. Salahuddin Ayyubi tried to take it back, right, Rahimahullah, but he wasn't able to. So he can join the list of many conquerors who weren't able to successfully conquer Gaza itself. And later on, when he liberated Jerusalem in 1187, Gaza would automatically fall into his hands, right? So Gaza's fate is linked with the fate of Jerusalem or vice versa. Now, the Crusades will continue after Salahuddin. You see Richard the Lionheart, briefly conquered Gaza as well in the Third Crusade, uh, but he wasn't able to hold on to it because he signed a treaty with Salahuddin, and then he left and returned back to uh, England. In 1239, as the Crusades continue, um, the Crusaders were defeated at Beit Hanun, which is one of the cities in the Gaza Strip today, uh, by Shuja al-Din al-Kurdi, uh, who was martyred in that battle. So this is one of the famous heroes of Gaza in Islamic history. And uh, in the city of Gaza, you have the neighborhood of Shuja'iya, Right, so the neighborhood of Shuja'iya is named after this particular leader, and this has historically been the um, where the the Ashraf, where the nobility of the city of Gaza live uh, in the city of Gaza, the Shuja'iya neighborhood. Um, and then the other thing to note is that the Mongols, when they are conquering their way all across the Muslim lands, their furthest 
po uh, point of expansion, apart from Anatolia, apart from Turkey, in the Middle East is going to be the city of Gaza. So Hulagu Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, for a few months in 1260, he's able to conquer the city of Gaza and hold on to it. And he was actually planning a, an invasion of Egypt to conquer Egypt as well. But the Mamluks, who by then had been established as a dynasty in Egypt, were able to take the city of Gaza back as well as most of Palestine back at this famous battle that occurred in Ramadan, uh, the Battle of Ain Jalut. Now, the prosperity of Gaza under the Mamluks, so now the Mamluks are in control after 1260. From 1260 until World War I, there's going to be relative peace in the city of Gaza. Relative peace, but only one major disruption, which we'll speak about. I just want to make a few quick notes here. When the Muslims have now reestablished control in the region, they rebuild the Omari Masjid in 1260, right? And they make a library, a famous library, with containing 20,000 books uh, in the year 1260 is established along with the Umari Masjid. Um, they also establish a Han in Khan Yunus, right? So I just gave it away. It's named after him. Amir Yunus al Nauruzi establishes a Han, which is basically like a motel for merchants. So they're really encouraging trade. They're really re establishing Gaza as a center of trade, a center of cultural exchange. That happened in 1387. Travelers increase to Gaza. As the city, you know, again, is becoming very prosperous. So Ibn Battuta is one of the travelers who visits the city of Gaza. And he makes a note about its openness. Ibn Battuta says that Gaza is one of the few cities that does not have walls. It does not have protective walls. Meaning it's an open environment. People come, people go, people trade, people of all religions are worshipping there. And you see this in the testimonies of other people as well. Large population, twice as large as the city of Jerusalem. And the inhabitants of Gaza include Ethiopians, Arabs, Egyptians, Syrians, Indians, Jews, as well as Eastern Christians. Right, So people are traveling from all over the place and they've settled there. Um, and it continues to be a very fertile region. Right, So Al-Dimashki, uh, in around 1300, he records that Gaza is so rich in trees that it looks like a cloth of brocade spread out on the land. So you have desert in all directions. Gaza is very, very fertile. So it's a flourishing place at this time. And there's also an increase in Jewish travel, particularly from Europe, to the city of Gaza at this time. Um, and you see there uh, one of the testimonies uh, by one of the rabbis who comes from Italy in 1481 to visit the city of Gaza. He says the Arabs call the city Gaza. It's good and praiseworthy land. Its fruits are amazing. Good bread and wine are to be had here. Historically, these are the two most important industries um, that Gaza is linked to. So I'll stop there. He says the latter is made only by the Jews. So the Jews are allowed under Muslim rule to continue even their wine making industry, right? To do that work that they used to do. But I just want to go back to the previous point. Gaza is a bread basket because it's very fertile, right? And so its uh, bread is going to reach very far and be used in very different ways. So, for example, until the modern period, for the Hujjaj, for anyone who went for Umrah and Hajj, bread would be imported from Gaza. So Gaza would export bread that was used to feed the Hujjaj or, you know, export the grains, basically, that would then be turned into bread to feed the Hujjaj. At the same time, exports from Gaza would go all over Europe. And if you look at old British newspapers, you will see advertisements for alcohol. And it will say that this alcohol has been specially prepared with barley that was brought from the city of Gaza. Right, So in that sense, it was also uh, a very important source of barley that, as we know from those advertising, is going all the way to the UK as well. And this is way before uh, the UK actually got involved uh, in the region. And you see there the inhabitants of the city are numerous, including 60 Jewish families and four Samaritan families. This is an old picture of the, the motel that we mentioned, the caravanserai, Khan Yunus, right around which the city of Khan Yunus would develop. Um, Jews in Gaza under the Ottomans is basically the same story as before. You can quickly take a picture because I'm just going to move on to the next slide uh, for lack of time here. Um, this is the turning point. Napoleon. You guys have heard of Napoleon? Not the rapper, guys. <laughs> Right, There's a rapper Napoleon as well that many of the youth seem to confuse my Napoleon with uh, in presentations on history, ironically enough. So nevertheless, Napoleon Bonaparte, the French military general, and later on the French emperor, 
is a very adventurous individual, very, very interesting individual, and his decisions had long-lasting consequences for the Middle East as we know it today. So Napoleon invades Italy, right? And early on in his career, the French Empire is expanding. He invades Italy, and when he reaches Italy, he sees the Jews of Italy living in ghettos. Like, you know, Italy is a Catholic uh, you know, power at the time, obviously. And he sees the Jews of Italy, they're living in ghettos, they're subjugated, they're in very difficult conditions. And the Jews for their, and what he decides to do as part of his liberation of Italy is also liberate the Jews, right? So he, he makes them all kinds of promises and he promises to free them. And it is said that he had this kind of ambition to be like Cyrus the Great. What did Cyrus the Great do? Does anyone remember? He reestablished the Jews where? Back in Jerusalem, back in Palestine, right? And that's something that Cyrus the Great was celebrated by Christian Europe throughout history. This Persian emperor who was not Christian, but he was celebrated um, uh, for that reason, for or among the reasons, because he reestablished the Jews in Palestine. Um, and so in this particular context, Napoleon starts to imagine himself as a Cyrus-like figure in the modern period. And he's the first European leader to introduce this idea, why don't we actually take the Jews all over Europe and establish them in Palestine? Now, is he the first person to think of this idea? No. He's the first person to link this idea which is a religious idea for Christians. So we'll talk about that in a second. He's the first person to link this idea with the growing military power of Europe, right? So before it was theoretical that we should do this. Now we actually can do this. The Ottoman Empire is getting weaker. So Napoleon is the first one who's introducing all these ideas, but he's not the first one to think of them. So what do we mean by that? In Christian history, remember we mentioned how many temples have already existed, quote unquote temples, two, right? First temple and second temple. In Christian belief of restorationism, the Jews will be re-established in Palestine and then the third temple will be built on top of the Temple Mount where Masjid al-Aqsa is now. The third temple will be built there and that is a prelude to the second coming of Christ, to the coming of the Messiah. So then what's going to happen? Right? Then Jesus is going to come and then most of the Jews that we resettle in Palestine will convert to Christianity. And those who don't convert to Christianity, we will kill them. Right? So imagine this. First, we will resettle them there. We'll help them rebuild the third temple. Jesus will come and we will convert them to Christianity. Whoever doesn't want to convert, we will simply kill them. And then there will be the Messianic age. 1,000 years of peace. Right? This is Christian belief, core Christian belief that all of this is going to happen. These are, this is their version of the signs of Day of Judgment, right? Except, I would humbly say, quite a lot more ridiculous, right? So what Napoleon says is that, hey, we know all of this is supposed to happen. Why don't we actually make it happen? Why don't I become the Messiah in the sense that preludes to the actual coming of Jesus Christ? Who doesn't want to meet Jesus, right? Even to this day, which is why the idea of Christian Zionism is so important to the existence of Israel. Without Christian Zionism, it's very, very difficult to imagine that Israel would have ever existed. There's more Zionists who are Christian in the Bible Belt in the southern United States than there are Jews in the entire world, right? There are not that many Jews in the entire world, but there are so many Christian Zionists for whom this is part of their belief. They are trying to hearken the second coming of Jesus by doing this. We will reestablish the Jews in Palestine, they will rebuild the third temple, right? And then Jesus will come, and as I explained, the story will proceed. So this belief of restorationism quickly becomes, when the Zionist movement emerges among the Jews, right? It quickly becomes molded into what we know today as Christian Zionism. And many of the Jews in Napoleon's time actually begin to think of him as the Messiah, as the Jewish Messiah, right? That he is liberating the Jews, and he is promising to reestablish the Jews in Palestine. What Napoleon is actually interested in, which will always be the case, more interested in, is basically giving the French an edge over the British. For the British, 
India is now their lifeline. They have conquered India. They have established control over India. And all the other European empires are just trying somehow to cut off Britain from India because as long as Britain has India, it is too powerful. There is too much manpower, too many natural resources in India for any of the other empires to really be able to compete on the world stage. So Napoleon is writing letters to Tipu Sultan, right, who was one of the Muslim rulers of South India who was fighting against the British. He's writing letters to local Arab chieftains and what is now Dubai and Oman and uh, Qatar and all of these places. He's trying to get anyone in the Indian Ocean who is interested in cooperating with the French to rise up against British rule and he says the French will support you. Now also he wants to control the land bridge, right? So after he's done conquering Italy, he gets permission from the French government to invade Egypt. He invades Egypt. His invasion of Egypt is not particularly successful, but he also invades Palestine. Right? He's trying to get any foothold in that particular region. And so Napoleon invades Palestine, as you can see there. He captures the city of Gaza. He captures the city of Jaffa. He lays siege to the city of Akka for two months in March 1799. And even the French sources uh, extol the bravery of Al-Jazar and the Ottoman soldiers who were defending the city of Akka from Napoleon. Al-Jazar was Bosnian, so this is the famous Bosnian defender of Palestine from Napoleon's invasion. Also Al-Jazar, uh, he had many of the Palestinian Jews fighting against Napoleon as well. Um, so the local Jews were not so much interested in you know, Napoleon's crazy plans to resettle all the Jews of Europe in Palestine, etc. They were actually defending the Ottoman Empire and fighting for it. Similar ideas were also, as you can see, there uh, circulating among the Russians, the Empress Catherine the Great, etc. Um, and so ultimately Napoleon, because of other reasons, he's not able to hold on to Palestine. He's not able to hold on to Egypt. So he's not able to actually live his dream that he had had. But he's introduced this dream into the European leaders who are very impressed by his success. He is the modern Alexander. He is the modern Cyrus the Great. He nearly achieved what every, everyone thought was impossible. He nearly reunited all of Europe under his rule. Right, This one French general, Napoleon Bonaparte. But ultimately, of course, he will be defeated. So what happens later on then is that the French have a close relationship with the Ottomans and they are able to get some capitulations, which is basically saying that the French are... Uh, so, so basically, it makes the Christian French citizens of Palestine dual citizens in a sense. Yes, you are Ottoman, but also the French have certain control over you to protect you from the Ottoman authorities. At the same time, the French build the Suez Canal. You guys know what the Suez Canal is? We're almost done here, guys. Anyone not know what the Suez Canal is? Right? You guys remember when that one ship got stuck? like two years ago or something, and the whole world was like shutting down because the Suez Canal was blocked. So that's in the modern time. Imagine centuries earlier, right? So the Suez Canal is established in 1869 by the French, by a French company that has special permission from the Ottomans to establish the Suez Canal. Now, the British are like, no way. Again, they realize that this is going to cut off their whole Asian empire, particularly the jewel of the empire, which is India. So the British in 1884, they conquer Egypt, they kick out the French, they kick out the local Egyptian authorities, they kick out the Ottomans. They say this route is so crucial for us that nobody else will control it, right? So now the British control Egypt, which means they protect the Suez Canal from one side. But what is on the other side of the Suez Canal? Gaza, Palestine. Right? So suddenly, Palestine is very, very important to protect Palestine, which is technically still ruled by the Ottomans, and it's, uh, <coughs> specifically the city of Gaza, uh, from um, becoming ever a threat. And during the First World War, their fears would actually be proven right because the Ottomans and the Germans would launch an invasion of Egypt from the city of Gaza and nearly captured the Suez Canal. So the British weren't worrying for no reason. They did have a legitimate worry if you're looking at it from their perspective. Now, what's going to happen then is all of these factors are going to combine. You have the desire to protect the Suez Canal, which is a huge lifeline for your trade, for your military movements, everything like that. You have the messianic fantasies, which I described earlier, restorationism, Christian Zionism. You have this rhetoric of modernization, 
right? That the Ottomans are incapable of modernizing Palestine. Only a European power can do it. Only the British can do it. And this rhetoric is actually what is pushed by the Zionist movement. They say, no, not even you guys. We'll do it for you. Just militarily help us take the land of Palestine. We will modernize it. And they have continued to use this rhetoric. Why? Because it resonates in the West, right? So the Zionist propaganda is always linked to the rhetoric of modernization. Netanyahu said a few years ago that if Hamas was to leave Gaza, we in a few years, we will turn Gaza into the Singapore of Asia, right? Or the Singapore of the Middle East, whatever his precise words were, right? He says, no, these are like some backwards, crazy people, etc., etc. If Hamas was to leave, this would be like Singapore tomorrow, right? The city of Gaza. So this rhetoric of modernization continues even today. The Ottomans engage with the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement approaches the Ottomans, also seeking their help to establish themselves in Palestine. And basically, the Ottomans are not interested at all, right? And the Ottomans get a lot of flack because of a lot of misinformation that they let the Zionist movement come in too early. In fact, the Ottomans were super, super cautious, right? They were super cautious of actually letting... Um, uh, beyond like small scale Jewish migration, you know, pilgrimage and other things that had already gone on for centuries, right? And some small farming families, settlement, etc. If you actually read the history, the Ottomans were super protective of Palestine against the uh, Zionist movement. Nevertheless, the Ottomans are losing control in general. So you have the First World War. And during the First World War, Palestine is promised to three different parties. It's promised to the Jews in the Balfour Declaration. The British don't actually control Palestine yet. It's not theirs to give away. But they're promising it anyway. They're saying, we will defeat the Ottoman Empire and then we will give it to the Jews. Balfour Declaration. Secondly, you have the McMahon Hussein correspondence. Sharif Hussein was the person in charge over Hijaz in Mecca and Medina, specifically in the city of Mecca, right? And he's from the Banu Hashim, right? From the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he works with the British to organize the Arab revolt against the Ottomans, right? Because they say that the Ottoman Empire is going to fall anyways, but we want to give Palestine and Syria and all of this region to you Arabs. So help us out. We'll just reestablish you there, right? And not realizing how they're going to be deceived. But so you promise it to the Jews, you promised it to the Muslim Arabs, and now what are you doing actually, secretly? You have your official Sykes and Pico who are taking a map of the Middle East, drawing lines, here's your strategic interest, here's my strategic interest, etc., etc., and that is how they're going to actually divide up the Middle East. Now the war ends, and Palestine is conquered in December of 1917. You see the battles of Gaza there, the first and the second battle of Gaza. So the British were not able to conquer uh, Jerusalem until they actually defeated Gaza. And it would take them three battles. And in fact, in the first two battles, there were a lot of Canadians, uh, including Canadian officials who fought for the British in the Battle of Gaza. Uh, and some of them, because the British were so thoroughly humiliated and defeated, some of them were actually sent packing back to Canada. They were dismissed from service because of their poor performance on the battlefield. Um, nevertheless, in 1917, uh, Jerusalem will fall to the British. Now, the British occupation begins in 1917. And the British say that um, they go to the League of Nations, which is the precursor to the United Nations after the war, and they say, hey, give us the mandate over Palestine, right? We're the ones who created this mess. We will clean it up. We promised it to the Jews. We promised it to the Arabs, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we'll, we'll be the ones to clean it up. Just give us a certain sort of mandate. So they try that, again, pursuing actually their own colonial imperial interests, right? The world is changing. So they can't just go in and say, oh, we want to add Palestine to our empire. They say, give us a mandate to manage Palestine until the locals are ready to basically rule Palestine for themselves, etc. So that's the mandatory Palestine, the mandate of Palestine that is going to last from 1920 until 1948, including the Second World War. And during the Second World War, the Germans and the Italians threatened to attack Palestine. And the German army, the Nazi army, is marching through North Africa towards Egypt. And they say, we're going to take Palestine. Again, Suez Canal. Everybody wants the Suez Canal so they can cut off the British, right? And so um, uh, the uh, British say, basically, um, or basically the Zionist movement comes to the British and they say, hey, just give us guns. We will defend Palestine, right? We're the ones who you've reestablished here. But who are those guns actually for? Right? Who are those guns? What are those guns actually going to be used for? They're going to be used for the Nakba. 
So the British, during the Second World War, they heavily armed the Zionists in Palestine because the Zionists say, we are going to serve in the military. We're going to serve as a paramilitary force. We will defend Palestine from anyone. And the British are like, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Why? Because obviously we don't want to lose the Suez Canal. Same old logic. But as soon as the war ends, the British are too weak now. They leave India. They create the partition of India. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh messy situation will continue for decades until today. They'll do similar partitions in other parts of the world, including in Palestine, a very, very messy UN partition plan, not really factoring in the fact that, hey, we armed a bunch of people. What do you think is going to happen if we suddenly leave, right? So the Zionists then carry out what's known as the Nakba in 1948 as part of the establishment of the state uh, of Israel. So that's where my presentation typically ends. The modern history of Gaza and Palestine would require a lot more time to go through because there's a lot of false information and there's a lot of concepts that have to be very, you know, detailed uh, discussions are required to really understand what happened there. Here's a general, you know, the Visualizing Project, uh, Palestine Project is a Canadian project. It's based in Vancouver. It's these scholars and these graphic designers who come together to make these amazing infographics about um, the history of Palestine as well as the current situation there. So I highly encourage you to check out the Visualizing Palestine project and to support it. But as we can see, as I mentioned earlier, revisionist Zionism trying to control as much territory as possible. Um, the Israelis themselves tried to conquer the Suez Canal as well. They tried to take control of Gaza for the same reasons as throughout history, it has been so strategic and so important and so coveted, uh, it continues to be so. Finally, before we get into the Q&A, uh, I just want to draw your attention to uh, these books. Um, if you can only read three books on the history of Palestine, and I think we can all read three books on the history of Palestine, inshallah. We are curious about this topic and it's important for us to learn. I would recommend these three books to you. Um, they are very detailed, very well researched, very easy to read, and they're easy to find as well. So you can purchase them, inshallah, or maybe check your local library or something to that effect. Uh, and again, if you have to leave, please go ahead. Jazakumullah khairan, everyone, for attending, for listening. Please pass on this information. We will begin the Q&A, but before we begin the Q&A, I just want to say one more thing. Um, I'm on this tour with Sakina Canada. Um, Sakina Canada isn't a history educational organization, right? Um, but the spirit with which they responded when I reached out to them and said, hey, you know, they are my friends. I say, I want to go around to different masajid and teach the history of Palestine, but obviously there's a lot of logistics involved. I can't take care of all of it myself. And they were so responsive, right? They were so ready to facilitate that. And I think it reflects the spirit that all of us as Muslims should have at this time that we need to leave no stone unturned in doing whatever we can to support the Palestinian cause. Whatever we can, even if it's not your core work, we all have specialties, we all have kind of special situations that we can take advantage of. Nevertheless, when the opportunity presents itself, we should take that opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make the most of that opportunity. So that's what Sakina Canada did. You know, they, they run shelters uh, for people who are in need of shelters, Muslims specifically, right? Culturally sensitive shelters. They also have the People's Market, which is very thoughtfully designed and very thoughtfully run so that people can use it as a food bank without you know, feeling demeaned in any way or anything like that. So they are uh, doing a lot to serve the local Muslim community. We know it's a difficult economic situation for a lot of people. It's getting worse. So please, I encourage you, please do support them. Uh, support all of their work. Go over there uh, to their table and please donate if you can. Spread the word about their work. Uh, connect people who may be benefiting, able to benefit from their services to them, etc. All of these are things that you can do to support them, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, and I will take questions, easy ones only. <laughs> no hard questions, please. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Assalamualaikum, Jazakallah Khair for coming. This question you may not be able to answer, but I'll ask anyways. Sure. I'm sure you've heard this question as well. Uh, in the Quran, it comes that is it, I believe Jerusalem falls twice. One has already happened. Would you by any chance know or do you have a perspective? Did the second already happen or is it going to happen in the future? So I do not know. Jazakumullah khairan for the question because it is important to acknowledge that. Nabushad Nazar, yeah. Yeah. 
I've read different opinions, but it's kind of above my, like, in terms of the tafasir of, of and especially when it comes to, like, our own eschatology, the signs of the Day of Judgment. Um, I'll, I'll stay in my lane, basically, with the history, inshallah, but uh, it does, it's important to note that whether that's already happened or will still happen, it is mentioned in the Quran, right? And it's an important thing to connect with the uh, concept of the covenant, even in the Jewish religion itself, right? When they say God promised us this land, even in their own religion, it's not saying anywhere that God promised you this land because of your ethnicity, because you are the descendants of Yaqub alayhi salam, or anything of that sort. Even the promise that is there alludes to the fact that you have made a covenant with God, right? You have made an agreement to abide by certain teachings uh, of God. And if you were to violate that agreement, then that land that is promised to you, that promise is violated as well. Right, so it's for people with certain qualities, right? And what would the qualities that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala would prescribe? What would they be? I mean, justice would have to be the number one, right? If you cannot deal with that land justly, similar to the ayah we recited at the beginning, it's a land that Allah has blessed for all people. It's a specially blessed land. So if you are in that specially blessed land and you are able to attain power then you also have a special responsibility, more so than in other situations, to make sure that you use that power justly, that you don't commit injustice, right? So if you take advantage of the blessing and then take advantage in a way that you oppress other people, that is an even greater sin than it would be in another context, right? So all of these things are important. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you brought that up. It just, uh, we'll have to consult with scholars who are more qualified in that to... Uh, to find the actual answer, inshallah. Any other? Okay, we got some questions yeah. on the sister side. <coughs> First of all, um, Jazakallahu Khair for this informative lecture. It's Why been yaku? amazing. Um, my question is, the current day Jews who are living in Palestine, some people claim that they are not part of the original 12 t tribes of Bani Israel. And some people claim that they came from Khazar, who are, I think they used to be in Romania. They yeah. decided to convert to Judaism. My question to you is, um, and in, it's in Surah Isra, لَتَعْلُمُنَّا عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا لَتَفْسِدَنَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَلَتَيْنَ do you think the same verse would be applicable to people who are actually not from the original 12 tribes of Bani Israel? What's your interpretation of that? So that's another interesting question that I'll say right off the bat, I don't know the answer to, right? I have not looked into that. I haven't studied that. Um, I know a little bit about the, the Khazarian origin thesis. Um, people, some people take that even further and link it to Yajuj and Majuj and all kinds of, you know, it's, a, it's an entire field in itself that I haven't really had the chance to explore. Um, I do think that the question of ethnicity, right, is important to address because you will find in the Zionist framework of arguments when they try to argue, they will try to move away from the messiness of history, right? They don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the history necessarily, right? All they want to say is that we were here for thousands of years before in the past at some point. But what they are very eager to do is get into questions about um, ethnicity, Despite, ironically, like those genetic tests, those DNA tests are banned in Israel, right? For a reason. You actually cannot take it. And you find Jews like on TikTok and things like that. They come to the United States just to get a genetic test, just to find out. And then they find the results that they are not from some kind of pure Jewish ancestry or something like that. And they're shocked, right? The results are from all over the place, from Africa, from Asia. They are a mixture of people, right? So that's one aspect to keep in mind. The other thing I will say is that um, I, I think it's important, even with this history that I presented to you, even with questions about ethnicity, etc., right? Let's say that your argument is valid. Let's say that you, like your argument that Jews were here and then they were forcibly removed and that's why they have a right now to come and reestablish themselves here in Palestine, or your argument that the Jewish people of Israel today are direct descendants of those ancient people who lived for hundreds of years in Palestine, etc., in all of these things, how does that justify the oppression that you are committing, right? So this is where I think that in our anti-oppression work, in our pro-justice work, it can become a distraction to get involved in these kinds of discussions, right? Let's say everything you say was true about the past, about history, your entire narrative is true. 
how does that still justify the oppression that you are committing? You know, like you, you were denied your rights in history and you were expelled by the Romans and your temple was destroyed and, you know, your ancestors who you are a direct descendant of apparently have now come back and reestablished themselves. How does that justify killing little children in Gaza? Right. So while I don't have, I'm not saying this is the answer to your question because I don't have the answer. I apologize. That's something that I have to study and look into, inshallah. But nevertheless, it's important for us to use the history in a very intelligent way, but make sure the history itself doesn't become a distraction. Right. Let's say the entire history, none of it existed. Everything started. Let's say even everything started on October 7th. Let's say the way they say it. You know, they act as if everything started on October 7th. Even in that case, how do you justify? And can any other people who are in conflict in any other part of the world, can they use the same justification to commit the atrocities that you are now committing? Right. So that's, that's a couple of important aspects to keep in mind, but it's, it's a good question, inshallah. We'll hopefully someday discuss the answer. Jazakum Allah khairan. Um, yeah, sorry. Assalamualaikum. Um, I think you answered, um, I was, my question was very similar, so I'll maybe reframe my question. Um, so would you say then the term, the term Zionism, which is, um, the, um, the belief that, you know, Jews have the right to, for self-determination and establishing their sovereignty on indigenous land, would you say that then that we should not be sort of questioning indigeneity, uh, because it sort of is a big question mark around whether they were for sure part of the people that originally lived there. Um, as a historian, how would you tackle that? Like, right, what should we as Muslim kind of um, address Zionism within just its short term, like meaning of what the definition is? And then a, a very simple question, is the word Gaza uh, derived from Gazwa? Like because of battles? What's the origin? Uh, no, so I think you came a bit, bit late. We actually okay. discussed both of those questions. I did come late. So, yeah, no problem. So That's the word Gaza, uh, the most common origin is, it's a very, very old name, but the most common origin is an ancient Egyptian uh, language. It's the city of Gaza, the prize city, right? So it comes from an ancient Egyptian uh, language is the, the most common uh, accepted theory. Um, in terms of the question of indigeneity, the thing that I that I mentioned is that, you know, indigeneity for our context is very different from indigeneity in different contexts in different parts of the world. So when, and, and the Zionists know this, right? So when they say we are the indigenous people of Palestine, and to some extent the Palestinians as well, right? Like the Mahmoud Abbas, he gave a famous statement. He's the leader of the Palestinian Authority. He gave a famous statement in 2017 that we are the descendants, direct descendants of the Canaanites, and we have lived here continuously for 5,000 years, right? So we are not newcomers, etc., etc. So if we go all the way back, right, to this map that we see here, when we talk about indigeneity in the American, Canadian, Australian, New Zealander context, again, it is referring to the fact that a foreign group of people came on a very specific date that we know and began to interact with another group of people who had developed culturally, um, ethnically, in every sense, completely separately with no history of intermixture. Right, So there are two disparate histories are very clearly traceable. We know what the indigenous, to some extent, we know what the indigenous culture and religion and uh, their empire and everything was like before the arrival of the Europeans in Canada, and it had absolutely no intermixture right, with the Europeans, etc., in the past. So when Zionists say that we are indigenous to this land, they know the audience that they're speaking to because a Canadian who is uninformed sitting at home is going to say, oh wait, yeah, you guys are indigenous to this land and we're fighting for maybe indigenous rights here as well, right? So the land obviously belongs to the people. Um, this is the argument of anteriority. Whoever was there first, demonstrably, should have sovereignty over that particular land. But if you look at the actual history in different parts of the world, including the history as is outlined here, that definition, that conceptualization of indigeneity cannot be neatly applied to the region of Palestine for the, the sheer fact that you see all of these different 
political entities that have existed in Palestine. All of them brought their armies. All of them brought their merchants. All of them brought their culture. All of them constantly intermixed with each other, right? To the point that some groups completely assimilated into the cultures of others. New groups emerged from within that same land and went through the entire cycle. They emerged from Palestine and then they disappeared back into the general culture of Palestine of some other entity, etc. There is no clear divide, right? There is no clear separation of histories where we can say that, okay, these people were clearly indigenous and these people were outsiders who had come and established themselves in that land. So I think, to, to give a very basic answer, the same concept of indigeneity does not apply, right? Because um, the situation, the history, the recorded history, and even if we look at it from an ethnic perspective, right, from a linguistic perspective, the level of intermixture just leads us to a point where it's very, very difficult to determine who is indigenous, right? A Palestinian today could be a descendant of the Bani Israel of ancient times, Right? or the Ammonites, or the Moabites, or the Nabataean Arabs, or like, you know, all of those things, and vice versa. Like, so, so it's important to kind of uh, point to the complexity, right? Point to the complexity. And then the second argument, again, I will go back, as much as I love sharing the history and as important as it is for us to know the history, even if you were indigenous, purely indigenous, you made the claim, it stands on firm evidence, everything, does that give you the right then to do what you are doing, right? Does that give you, I, I would always, in any discussion you have in history about the history of this particular land, bring it back to that question, right? What rights come, if you are the indigenous people, what rights come with that, right? Are you entitled to do absolutely anything you want, including massacre people who you consider non-indigenous? So I know it's not a, it, it's a complicated topic, right? So not, not something that thoroughly, kind of establish in a Q&A. But I'll move on. Jazakallah khairan. We have one question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Allah salam. khair for this whole presentation. You're welcome. Um, I had a question. So I know they believe that the Haikal Suleiman was built under the, or it's under the Masjid al-Aqsa. Um, where does that play in history? I've, uh, like I've never really heard a confirmation, but that's what they say. And obviously we know you tell a lot of lies, so um, <laughs> yeah. Um, your stance on that? Yeah. So the Haikal Suleiman, right? Like the the Temple of Solomon, as they refer to it. So obviously, there's a lot of sensitivities about doing any kind of archaeological work on the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary, as we refer to it, atop of which is Masjid al-Aqsa. So not a lot of archaeological work has been done, but they'll always present it as if we want to do the archaeological work, we just can't because these crazy Muslim people, we don't know what they might do, the site is sacred to them too, etc., etc. So the thing about archaeology is that if you had an independent group of archaeologists go there and actually do the research and present their findings, that could actually go against your narratives. When you're doing historical you know, propaganda, propaganda that's rooted in history, sometimes you don't want too much evidence. You want a certain degree of evidence so people kind of trust you and they take what you say for granted, but you don't want necessarily too hard evidence that could complicate the story and actually go against the narrative that you're claiming, right? So maybe it would go against the narrative that they're claiming. So bottom line is not a lot of archaeological work has been done. Maybe nobody necessarily wants archaeological work there to be done either, right? Um, and in a general sense, from the uh, Muslim sources, we don't have a lot of details about, first of all, what it looked like, right? Nobody agrees on what it looked like. So that itself is, there's, there's the physical descriptions are very generic in the sense that people try to draw it out, like in the biblical narrative. They're more detailed. They, even then, they try to draw it out, but it often looks like a Greek Parthenon or looks like something like, you know, there's not a lot of clarity. And so that from the get-go means that it's very difficult to reestablish where do you even look, right? You know there was a building on the site. You can establish that much. What was that building, right? Was it the Temple of Solomon? Did it have all the rooms that are described in the Bible? All of these things are going to be very, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to ever establish. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So I did catch the piece where you were talking about Christian Zionism and their kind of story where they'll convert everybody to Christianity. Those that don't convert, they will 
uh, get killed. Are the Jewish Zionists aware of that, and why does it look like they're working together if they are? Or I like mean, Plan A is still in our favor, right? <laughs> the first step of the plan is still very much in our favor, so might as well continue with it. So they're aware of that. They're definitely aware of that. It's not like a, it's it's not a big secret. This is very very openly discussed the doctrine of restorationism and stuff like that. And the Christian nations have actually competed, specifically the Protestant nations. They have competed. It's not an accident that the Catholic nations were not at the front of the race to reestablish Israel or to establish Israel. Right? It's Britain, Protestant nation. Right? Germany was at the front of the race, Protestant nation. You had, even though the Germans fell back very early on, uh, then you have America, right? The part of the founding of these nations, right? If you look at American history, the founding of America, even if you look at the founding of the English as a nation, how they conceptualize themselves is that we have a God given role to bring about the second coming of Christ, right? And how do we do that? Oh, yeah, we have to reestablish the Jews in Palestine. Right? So the Jews are certainly aware of it, the Christians are certainly aware of it, but again, all of this religious rhetoric works in tandem with the material benefits, right? the colonial benefits, the actual benefits that you're trying to gain from establishing control in that territory. And so everyone is, you know, um, uh, you, you'll see even now the, the friction in the relationship between Jews and Christians, even now. right? You'll see videos like as a random example, like of a Christian abbot, a Catholic who is walking through like Jerusalem and the Jews are spitting on him as they walk by, right? There's a lot of tension between them because they're aware of their religious tension since day one. As a side point, one interesting thing you'll note if you study the history, the only time Jews and Christians and Muslims have lived in peace in Palestine, the only times is when the Muslims were ruling. Not during the Crusades when the Christians were ruling, not in Israel when the Jews are ruling, right? And not in ancient times before Islam when the Christians were ruling over the Jews. There's never been peace. Always tension and conflict and things of that sort. The only prolonged period of peace was during Muslim rule because they do have those frictions. They are aware of each other's teachings about each other, right? And so, but at the same time, when the colonial material benefits are available, yeah, yeah, like let's, okay, let's get through phase one. Let's establish... Israel first, and then whatever that biblical stuff is about the second coming and whatever they want to do, etc., etc., we will do that, right? Which is why they don't hesitate to call their closest allies anti-Semitic very, very easily. Anything that you do is anti-Semitism, right? And that's co coming from a post-Western, uh, post-Holocaust culture in the West, right, etc., where that, that word really resonates, that concept really resonates, but they're certainly aware that this is a wider Christian belief. So yeah. I guess my follow-up to that is, would you say then it's fair that they would, they anticipate perhaps after phase one that there would be a battle between the two? That they anticipate? Yeah, are, like, are the Christian Zionists and the Jewish Zionists anticipating that after phase one that they will then go to battle? Yeah, so this is what, the, the, this is what they refer to as Armageddon. Okay. Right, so they do anticipate a battle. That that is the concept of the Armageddon. That this is this battle will happen after the uh, second coming of Christ. Yeah. There's one more question the brother had. Oh yes. Um, so my question is, uh, you mentioned the uh, Zionist Jews that were armed by the British uh, during World War II and then carried out the Nakba. Um, where and when did these Zionists come from? Were they the local Jewish population, or were they um, like brought in earlier on, or like? So they were part of the, the the mandatory period. So heavy migration of Jews during the British mandate of Palestine, right, uh, following the Balfour Declaration. So during that mandatory period between 1920 and 1948, remember they were arming them in the 1940s, right? Even World War II happened. But before that, you had a 20-year period where there was a heavy, heavy migration of European Jews into Palestine um, under, under sort of British support and, and British protection. Um, so that's, that's basically, you know, you have the Yishuv, the old Yishuv, the old Jewish community in Palestine, very small in number um, and very much sidelined by the European Jews as they came in in large numbers, right? Because they might share a religion, but culturally they're very different centuries and centuries of different cultural experiences, etc. So they had the same kind of, and the Christians had the same kind of views, Orientalist views of Palestinian Christians. European Christians looked down on Palestinian Christians. European Jews looked on, down on Palestinian Jews, right? 
um, that these people have basically lost the fight. They can't do anything. They can't modernize Palestine, right? They can't establish Israel. They can't bring about the second coming of Christ. We Americans, Britons, people from Europe and other places have to basically do that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I think we're good to go. I know you wanted to be on your way, inshallah. Yeah, I got a, I got a long day ahead of me still, inshallah. So okay, well. I appreciate you guys coming. And um, yeah, uh, hopefully we can use this information uh, in a beneficial way. May Allah accept this gathering from us. May Allah forgive us for all our errors. And may Allah guide us to the best of knowledge and guide us to act upon it in the best of ways that are pleasing to Him and make this a small contribution from us uh, as a means towards the establishment of his justice for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Allahumma ameen wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I mean, jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much for, for coming and for taking the time to, to uh, take us through this very informative uh, session. And uh, again, we want to give a special shout out and thanks to Sakina Canada and they have their desk. We encourage all of you to please talk to them on your way out and, and talk to them about the, the excellent work that they're doing. And um, inshallah, support them financially and through other means as well. Zakumallah khair and wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.